Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, Marcus next door, I'm sure you will tell me if, if you can't. So hopefully you can. Just a couple of shouts out before we go. Jamie Barnwell, you definitely come first because I think you win the prize for being the most remote tonight, uh, this afternoon, and being most exotic as you're on the island of Bermuda. I am insanely jealous of that, um, but you're very welcome, Jamie. I haven't seen you for a while, but it's really good to catch up with you. Stuart Foster up in St. Helens, good to see you, sir. Really nice to, really nice to have you here. Javier Martin, Javier, I don't remember, I, don't, I can't remember where you're based, but I'll be good to have you. Um, there we go. Uh, Javier is a Catalan speaker, a little like Marta, who's um, doing the chat for us tonight. So uh, you guys can engage in some Catalan banter if you like, you guys. Try and avoid the politics, though. It can get a little bit heavy in that region, if you see what I mean. Um, and, and to everyone else, welcome. Thank you for being here. It's, it's sincerely appreciated. I'm sure we'll have a couple of people who will join us as sort of the school day ends and what have you. The, the, the focus of this afternoon's session is to try and get to a notion of the importance of practice and retrieval and what good practice and retrieval might look like with students. So hopefully I'm going to give you some ideas about that. I'm really happy to receive questions. I'll do my utmost to uh, answer them in my own experiences. There, there may be some things that I need to come back to you on, but I'll do my utmost to, to answer those things. Um, also, please be reminded that uh, this is a certificated course. So depending on whether you're attending one of our sort of summer series or you're attending six or seven of our summer series, we're going to provide you, once we've seen the attendance of people that have been with us, we're going to pr uh, uh, provide you with a certificate which recognizes your attendance in these um, as well. So that's, that's really important for me to, to stress. And basically, off the back of that, let's, let's kind of get going and see if we can uh, make some good progress. So what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to I'm going to share my screen with you and hopefully it's going to come across okay to you. So again, Marta, if the screen is not uh, on there, do let me know, please, because I would need to know that. But assuming it is, and you can probably see me uh, up in the corner as well, in fact, you're probably going to get to see quite a bit of my bald spot when I start leaning towards my media tablet in a second. But really, I've kind of got three objectives with this particular session, and they're obvious. They're on the board for you. Or they're, they're on the canvas there for you. I want to identify you know, how effectively we increase the tendency to remember things. Now, when I say we, I guess I'm talking about our students really, although it's not obviously irrelevant when it comes to teaching too. We're also looking to decrease the tendency to forget. I think we've all had that experience, right? Where we're working through a course, we are delivering to our utmost, we think we're doing a great job, we come to do something in the future, we come back to something we've done in the past, and students seem to, the knowledge of that seems to have dissipated, it seems to have gone, they can't recall that key terminology, that subject vocabulary that we believe we delivered and we taught so well. So what is it and how can we decrease that tendency to forget? And that's going to be a big theme. And for me, this is absolutely critical how to make what's learned meaningful if we can achieve those three things slightly better even in just in increments then of course we're going to potentially have quite big impact on learning and we're also going to have quite big impact on how people learn in the future it's quite proactive in that sense so with that in mind we are going to jump immediately and by the way the theory of this tonight I reckon is about 10 minutes all right so just bear with me I'm going to show you a lot of kind of practical application here but with that in mind I want to jump straight away to what is probably the pivotal theory we need to consider when it comes to what we might loosely call the forgetting cycle okay the forgetting cycle and that is a piece of research which is really stood up well against the test of time, which is the ebbing house forgetting curve. Okay, so I'm going to sort of introduce you to this, I'm not going to get too heavy about it, but it's going to, I think, illuminate certain points and certain experiences that you might have had, or that you perhaps might want to improve on. So this guy, Herman Ebbinghaus, we can broadly consider him to be a cognitive scientist. Um, the key information we need to draw out from, from this particular research is as follows. Look, at this point here, some individual, some learner, in this case a series of uh, subjects within a study, had some notion of 100% of whatever it was that they had learned, okay? So what we want to draw out of this is that if that learning was non-meaningful, non-meaningful and the study was designed to be non-meaningful by the way the things that they were learning and if it is not practiced if it is not practiced you know that new learning what we can notice here is that in 20 minutes let me choose a different color is that in 20 minutes 
approaching 50% of that new learning would have effectively been lost. We can establish that here, after one day, we're into the 30% of information which is retained. After 30 days, we're down at 25% retention of that original material. So that principle is an important one. It's really the idea of use it or lose it. Once you acquire something, once you develop a knowledge, once you learn something, that learning is temporary unless a couple of processes might take place. Of course, we want to start to think about what the implications of that might be. Now, can I stress to you guys that the information that Ebbinghaus reported on was non-meaningful. In fact, the way he actually did it was he asked his participants to remember what were called CBCs. He asked them to remember consonant, vowel, consonant combinations. So an, an example might be something like L, it might be, uh, it might be I, it might be H, okay? So this would be one of the things that people were asked to try and remember. He would not have asked them to try and remember this combination, lip. And the reason that is, is because that has meaning to people. So this curve we are looking at, the good news for us educators is, this looks dramatic. They just rip, they forget everything. It looks dramatic, but this sort of dramatic loss is for meaningless information. If we make learning meaningful, and I'm gonna talk about flashbulb memories and more meaningful learning in a second, the tendency to forget decreases, okay? Also, if learning is not practiced, the tendency to forget increases. Now, one of the things I'm gonna ask Marta to do, Marta, could you please uh, share with uh, delegates in the, in the webinar, could you please share with them the images I'm using here of the, of the different theories, that'd be great. It's on the links I provided you, so please post that into the chat. You can download these images and use them if you want to. So the question we want to sort of try and answer, guys, is how do we get this curve shallower and shallower and shallower? How can we prevent this forgetting from taking place? Okay, so let's just take it one stage further. Based on Ebbinghaus's, which I find really hard to say, work, we have this notion of the forgetting cycle. Now, what I want you to focus on here, guys, is this side of the curve, first of all, or this individual, this first curve initially. You should recognize the shape of that curve. It's essentially the forgetting curve we looked at before. Meaningless information, which is forgotten really relatively quickly. Now, what Ebbinghaus studied was that really significantly... However long that time period was of forgetting, let's just call it T, as we've got on the model here, to get from 100% retention to 8%. Whatever that time period was that took, that it took the, can, the, 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 the uh, participants to forget, he found out, and it's perfectly common sense, by the way, that if at this point here, if at this point in time here, you introduce a phase of practice and review, what happens is not only does the knowledge return potentially back to 100% retention, albeit temporarily, not only does it return to that, but notice what happens with the dissipation of knowledge subsequently. What we find now is that T, the time it takes to forget, is effectively doubled. Now, what does that mean? It means, and again, it's not I don't think this is rocket science, really. It kind of teaches us or tells us what our intuition probably already tells us. In that, if we have, if we have a practice or a review experience of something we've learned, something we have just got to the peak with, that is going to decrease. So it's going to decrease the tendency to forget. It's going to increase the time it takes to forget. And again, if we introduce another practice or review element. You notice now that what we find is that again, the forgetting experience elongates again. So I wanna draw out some implications for, for this. Not rocket science, practice equals slower forgetting. Okay, I mean, it makes sense, right? But I also wanna stress here, slower, slower forgetting slower forgetting equals better future learning. Now, look, just put that into context. 
we've all been in a situation where we've looked to move our learners on. Maybe it's the learning we're doing ourselves. We're looking to move them on, build on what's already been done. But if that base is fragile, if it's holy, if it's not being mastered, if it's not being retained, then that future learning can be undermined. And what we're arguing here, and again, common sense, is that practice and or review will increase the tendency to remember, slow down the process of forgetting, and as a result, will bolster and will underpin the tendency to learn new material more efficiently. Why? Because it's built on that that's gone before, or it's comparative to that that's gone before, or it effectively is synchronous or has an association with that that's gone before. It could simply be that the learner's more confident because they've forgotten less, which of course might bolster their, fu their future learning. So for me, those principles are really, really important. So we're already getting to the idea of, well, why, you know, what is this practice? What is this review actually gonna look like? And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of what that might be in a second. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about rose and shine and principles of instruction towards the end of this as well. But those principles for me should clarify, they should render down, let me just come back on the screen in a second they should clarify or they, they should render the issue down into a graspable idea. This is what we might be experiencing with our students when we expect them to remember, but in fact, the dissipation of knowledge has happened. The forgetting curve has taken place. They have forgotten, they aren't recalling, they haven't encoded that information to a degree which allows them to utilize it in the future. Okay, so those are some essential points. So I don't know whether there's any uh, questions at that point that, that anybody wants me to jump on with. What I'd say, Marta, is if, if there are questions that you want me to address, first of all, let, uh, you know, during, uh, let me know. Um, um, we'll go into that. I just want to introduce one more idea before we look at some direct implication of these ideas. Okay, guys? So Marta, do bring to me any questions that you think are pertinent, please. I'd appreciate that. Right, well, just back... Okay, thank you. Just back... And, and Marta, do, do feel free to jump in as well if I'm, if I'm banging on and... Uh, and there's something pressing, just jump in, okay? okay no um, <laughs> right, the most complex part of this evening, guys, the most complex part of this evening, but it won't, it won't take as long. This is what's called uh, Thalmia's reactivation curve. I should stress at this point, this is not a non-controversial uh, piece of research. There are people that agree with this and there are people that disagree with this. So just know that in advance, I'm presenting it as a, as a juicy morsel, something worthy of consideration, okay? Uh, in some ways, it, 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 some people argue that it butts up against the, the the Ebbing House work, but anyway, I won't get into that just for now. We'll we'll see them as kind of synchronous for now. And if you want to look into them more, you can do. I want you to focus really on the red element of this graph. Okay, so what do we have here? This curve, I would argue, represent. Let me choose some red color. I don't think I've got that red. Let me choose some red color. I'll go for pink. This red curve represents what we might call, and I, I don't know whether this is a fair description, normal school-based learning. What do I mean by that? Okay, and you know, what is normal? Who knows? Um, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that generally speaking, students will tend to learn something relatively quickly. Okay, and that will be interspersed with, with uh, experiences of teaching and practice during the learning cycle. You know, someone might teach us the idea. We might be asked to do a worksheet. We might be asked to answer a question. We might be asked in person to answer a question, that kind of thing. But ultimately, we're going to reach this peak of knowing and understanding. Okay, now, what Thalmia argued is that in what he referred to as the normal learning curve, which let's just call it fast learning, you might want to think about blocked rather than spaced or interleave learning. If you're interested in interleaving, by the way, guys, we're literally covering that on Thursday in another uh, webinar module. If you want to put the link in the chat for people, interleaving is where you get away from blocked based learning and you learn blocks of learning in parallel with one another. It's been proven to be really quite effective and also cost effective in school environments. Anyway, that's that. Now, so the normal learning curve is quite fast. But what Falheimer uh, sorry, argued is that this here is what you call the normal forgetting curve, okay? And the point we would make here is that the forgetting is also relatively rapid, okay? Now, just also notice as well that is that the dots after the learning has taken place are effectively testing episodes rather than practice episodes. Now, Thal, Thal, why don't I say Thalmer? I keep wanting to come out of my Thalheimer presented two alternatives to this. The first one 
is based on what's called the space learning curve. I just want to keep it simple for now. Again, come back on Thursday if you want more details about this concept. But he argued that this was a slightly slower, more deliberate learning curve. We learn and we practice it over a longer period of time, probably interspersed with other learning. And what we find is we ultimately reach the same peak of knowledge, but it takes longer. Remember, interspersed with other learning. So it's not necessarily going to elongate your course, but you know, just, just bear that in mind. The important thing is that the spaced, the spaced forgetting curve the spaced forgetting curve is much shallower. Notice this distinction. We have far less that's forgotten. Why? Because the learning progress itself has been slightly more gradual, slightly more deliberate, possibly interleaved, definitely spaced, and probably interspersed with other learning. But absolutely critical, what Thalheimer recognized was what he referred to as the reactivation curve. And this is where I really want you to bring your attention, please. Let's assume the same peak of knowing, whatever that peak is, high, low, mastery, whatever. Thalheimer argued that you can maintain that level of knowledge. And how do you do it? Notice the key at the bottom. He is arguing that with repeated episodes of teaching and practice, once the learning has been done, we can keep coming back to peak performance with regard to what has been learned. And he referred to that as the reactivation curve. And I think all of us need to reflect on our practice in school or our, maybe our systemic sort of assumptions we have in school. And then we think, right, okay, what is the tendency for my, to force my learners to go back and practice that which we finished before? And I think that's where practice and retrieval is truly powerful. Do we encourage, are we encouraging, how are we encouraging students to use information once they have initially learned it? And I repeat again, if you're interested in the interleaving spacing concept of delivery, come back on Thursday and we'll talk about exactly that. So I'm gonna stop my share there and I'm just gonna ask um, if there's any questions, Marta, feel free to jump in if there's anything you want to um, uh, put to me. Um, no, there aren't any. There aren't any any questions at um, at the moment. Um, everyone seems to be uh, just, you know, taking it in and uh, yeah, pretty much okay. um, agreeing. I hope. Um, yeah, I mean, would you? So, so do you think? I mean, according to the last um, the, the last image you showed, um, the 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 same sort of um, learning seems to be achieved following both models of learning, like what's to the left. So whether you take it um, more slowly and more, um, I don't know, the, the, yeah, whether you, you take the learning more slowly and you do it more st space learning curve, or you do it the, the normal learning curve, the, the same, the same point uh, of, the same of peak. yeah, the same peak seems to be seems to be achieved. Um, yeah, I mean, would you do, do you agree that um, yeah that, that you would achieve that same peak? I mean, obviously, okay, so, according to Thalheimer, you you, you would. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think, that's, that's I think quite an have, interesting. I think you have to remember that this is symbolic. So yeah. it's symbolic in the sense that it it want it, it's trying to the theory is trying to bring you to the point where no matter how much you've learned, this point here, whatever hundred percent of that is, or in this case, you know, they they've defined a bit lower, sort of eighty percent of all of the length, whatever that happens to be, the critical thing about how that information retain is retained comes from two cycles. One is how fast or slowly you've learned it. Mm -hmm. And the second one is whether you use it, what happens after the learning has actually been done. Now, the interleaving concept, again, which we're going to cover on Thursday, is a really interesting one because by nature, it makes the learning more deliberate, slightly slower. It, it, decreases, it decreases the tendency to move through things rapidly. But what's interesting about it is that it forces certain cognitive processes to take place because you're learning let's say you're learning two things that are relevant let, let's say two energy systems let's say you're learning uh, the aerobic uh, AT, the, the, the lactic acid system and the aerobic system at a level for argument's sake and you're learning them rather than seeing them blocked learn the first one learn the second one you're learning them synchronously what 
is argued in that interleaving there is that the tendency to view those things in context and make comparisons between them is far higher. And that therefore creates a greater residue in the mind. Now that therefore might explain why this spaced, or let's just jump to the idea of an interleave curve, might be slightly slower, but might cause a greater residue, might actually cause this residue to be, to be uh, less, or, or, the, or the, the loss to be less. But what we should be critically clear about is that, is that if we don't practice things as learners, and it's, look, it's not rocket science. We, we mm. know in our own sport and experiences, playing a musical instrument, learning whatever it happens to be. If we don't use that information, speaking a foreign language, if we don't use that information, I, I, speak, I speak Catalan about five or six times a year when I'm in, uh, when I'm in Barcelona, but if, if Javi and I were together right now, it would take me a bit to get back to my level, you know? There's a, there's a normality to that. Mm. What I do want to, sorry, God. Oh, no, I was going to say that Alex Thompson, he's got a question. I mean, would, would you sort of um, have uh, answered, he's, Alex is asking, by space learning, do you mean project learning that involves multiple facets? You were sort of, um, you, you sort of uh, hinted at, at that. Not necessarily. Space mm -hmm. learning simply means that there's gaps in between the learning episodes for reflection and other processes to take place. So that could be other learning. It could be utilization of that knowledge. It could be project-based learning, but it would simply put the program of getting to the peak of a particular series of ideas over a long period of time with other things interspersed in between. Now, mm -hmm. what that tends to be in most, um, what most educators will do with that, let me just come back on the screen briefly, is they'll, they'll, tend to, they'll tend to intersperse information on two levels. One, it will be new learning and old, lear old learning sort of interspersed. Or what it will be is it will be similar learning interspersed as, as people progress up that curve. So again, I don't want to jump too far forward to Thursday, but it's really the difference between what you might call blocked learning, you know, um, subject A, subject area one in lesson one subject area two in lesson two subject area three in lesson three and having more of a stream of development that that might be beneficial um, across a series of ideas that takes each one longer as an initial unit but of course as a combination would take presumably an equivalent amount of time mm -hmm. um, but i just want to be careful jumping to that that sort of spacing and interleaving teaching structure mm -hmm. that is literally what we're going to do on thursday so so do you yeah do jump on that one. And, uh, um, sorry, and Jamie's asking, I mean, it, it, it's, it's sort of touching on the interleaving as well, supposedly, he's asking, I guess the real consideration here is for teachers to implement creative and deliberate interventions of practice and review. Exactly. Yeah, and there's no reason why they can't happen before the learning cycle is finished, and they definitely need to happen after the learning cycle is finished. And notice the difference between the language of practice and testing. I think it's fair to say, look, I can only speak about my own career and I don't, in no way do I want to judge. I've never been in any of your classroom as far as I'm aware. But um, I think what my tendency was as a teacher was that I, I tended to see my role as delivering information until a unit was finished. And then afterwards, I would kind of test it sometimes to see what happened. Um, but what we're saying here is that there's a responsibility to force practice of that information over a cycle of time. And I'm going to show you some examples of that actually right now. If that's okay with you guys. Uh, let me let me jump on to here. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples from the Everlearner of how you want to do this. I, I'm logged in here. By the way, um, this is this is an example. Feel, feel free to make equivalent resources. Feel free to uh, do equivalent of what I'm going to show you or tweak these things or change them for your own model. But just be aware here, I'm logged in as Dr. McGonagall, Minerva McGonagall. She is Scottish and she teaches in a castle. She's also quite popular amongst uh, young people, especially young teenagers. Um, so what I've done with Dr. McGonagall here is I've set my students a bunch of assignments that I want them to do. So I want to click on assignments here, okay? And what I want you to focus on here is what I've done. I'm actually going to ask you to ignore this red one here because this is, um, uh, my colleague Mike has put this in recently, like in the last hour. Uh, this is actually nothing to do with our session. But I want you to focus on this assignment here. There's three hours of it left. And what I've called it is conduction system daily review. So I'm making an assumption here that my bunch of students have sometime very recently, forgetting curve number, very recently have learned this material on the conduction system, taking them to whatever that peak is. Okay, now what I'm going to do there is I'm going to ask them, if I click in here, I'm going to ask them to do eight questions. I'm going to ask them to repeat those eight questions until they score 90%. I'll, I'll talk about the high performance level in a few moments' time. 
and I'm going to ask them to use practice mode before the quiz for best results. So those of you not familiar with the EverLearner, the EverLearner has assignments and test mode, which is what I'm showing you here. But it also has practice mode, which is, which is a form of low stakes quizzing where students can go and practice things over and over and over again before they go in the higher stakes environment. It's what, it's what in theory is called building stakes. Okay. Now, my students have been busy with this assignment already. Remember, this potentially is something we learned this morning. Let's have a look at the data we've got. Fred hasn't done it, lazy little bugger. Fleur, first go... She did eight questions out of eight, she got 100%. Neville, look at this profile here. It took him three goes to get 50%, 88%, and 100% on that thing we learned earlier today. Good for Neville. Here, Hermione, one go, got there straight away. Harry, another lazy little bugger, um, had one go, 63%, and didn't repeat. Obviously, we'd look for that to be changed. Look here, Draco hasn't had a go at this yet, and I'll show you why, because I'm going to show you having a go at it in a second. So they learned it just now, yesterday, today, something like that. And what I'm doing is I'm making them go into a practice review environment where they're going to prove to me they've retained, there's residues there, they're going to bring it back to me in a very simple environment which doesn't take me any time. Let me show you how I follow that on as the teacher. Again, can I stress to you, this is one example. There are many other ways of doing this. Ignore this red one. This is my colleague um, doing something different. Look at these future assignments here, please. I've got one here, which is test yourself. It's going to open in two, in two days, which I'm calling the cardiac system weekly review. So the idea is that by the end of this week, we won't just have studied the conduction system, but we've studied some block of stuff that's a bit hearty. Okay. Now, if I click into this one, it isn't open yet, but notice the instructions. I'm going to ask them to do 12 questions. They're going to cover that material. So conduction systems in there, but it's not the whole experience. It's now interspersed with other areas. Repeat until you get a high standard. You can choose what that high standard is, perhaps different for different students. It's your call. And there's a bit of information about what to do if they're struggling. And that's the review meeting I'm going to have with them next week to go over how they how they performed in this quick review. It's probably going to be a very quick review meeting that I do with them. And if we go back to assignments again, look at this final uh, uh, example that I've given them here. I'm asking them to take a checkpoint, which is like an end of unit quiz, and it's a checkpoint three monthly review. That's not a three monthly review, but there's no hyphen there. It's checkpoint three monthly review. Okay, and in here, guys, in this one, it's going to open in nine days at the end of the month, Checkpoint three, all of cardiac and all of vascular. So the content is getting broader, high standard, do practice mode before getting stuck in. And if you're stuck, talk. Okay, so what I've done there as the teacher is I've said to them, right, just learned, practice. Learned a few days ago, practice again, interspersed with some other stuff we've learned. A week later, could even be, a month, could even be 30 days later, right? practice again for that stuff let's see if you still know it and if you if you don't obviously we'll we'll intervene and we'll uh, we'll correct we'll remediate we'll do what we need to do we'll practice some more we'll do review but the point is that there's a deliberateness that i'm going to cause even on that simple quizzing level that i'm going to cause a practice and repetition experience after the peak of learning has been achieved now again you can do that in all kinds of ways. You can set them paper-based tasks. You can, you can give them a worksheet, ask them to re redo it. You can set them a, a past paper question. None of that is wrong. None of that is all good stuff. But in the mix is things like this low stakes building to test mode stakes, the checkpoint mode, quiz stake quizzing. Okay, now for me, that's a really powerful tool that is hard for me to imagine doing without wanting to have these kinds of experiences. Now, what I am going to quickly do before we move on I'm just gonna time travel a little bit. Let's, let's just go in here and let's take our assignment. I'll quickly edit it. And what, is I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring it back so, it, so, it's, available, uh, so it's available to me. Uh, uh, so it's available to me. Oh, I can't bring it back, look. Um, so let me, let, me, let me do this. So start date. So let me, let me bring the start date back. Let me bring the start date back to now. Okay, so Draco will actually be able to have a go at this now as if, he, as if he's a time traveler. Let's just go back to our other assignments and I'll, and I'll quickly show you what Draco's experience would be. Uh, let's also take change the checkpoint. 
and let's start this back sort of at now. Okay, so Draco can have a little play. So let me just, uh, I'll just stop sharing a second. Let me just show you what Draco would experience here, guys. I just need to log in as him, so bear with me. Draco Malfoy, he's a, he's a talented yet tr troubled young student. Uh, demonstrating with. Right, okay, so let me, let me now show you a little bit of uh, Draco. So Draco's log, so we'd love to know Draco. Draco goes to his assignments and look what I've got. Here's my conduction system daily review. I've got my Cardex system weekly review, which we know is probably gonna open in the future, but just for now we feel like that. And we've got this checkpoint three monthly review test uh, quiz. So I go in here, okay, remember I've just learned conduction system today, say, or yesterday, say, I'm trying to beat that forgetting curve. I haven't had a go at this yet. All I have to do is follow my instructions and I'm gonna test myself. So I'm now into this learning. So I'm just gonna, so in this one, I've got a question. Um, so I'm just gonna be dragging some stuff in here, sisterly. Anyway, I'm not gonna read, I'm gonna get it wrong. I'm gonna just drag some stuff in randomly to answer this question, okay? I think I've answered it correctly, which I definitely haven't. I check my image for reference and I move on. Okay, there's my feedback. I do another question here. Um, which of these relate to the SA node and the AV node? So on the right atria is that one, secondary signal is that one, receive signal that one, between atria and ventricles that one, initiates electrical simulation that one, myogenic that one. But the point is guys, I'm utilizing that information which I've just learned. I'm being asked to reuse that knowledge. There's my answers, let's go on. This one, I've got to look at label E, E and F. So E is bundle of his. Uh, F is Purkinje fibers, and which other label was it? So E was bundle of his, F was Purkinje fibers, that makes D the septum, let's check. Yeah, D, oh no, E is the septum, let's get that the other way around, goodness me. So there you go, I'm, but I'm, I go through and I start to answer my questions. So guys, the point I'm trying to make here really, I'll, I'll sort of pause there, um, feature B, so what, why does it act downwards, it forces blood, to contract the ventricles, to force blood down into the ventricles. But the point I'm making there is, by, is that structurally, the learning has peaked and I'm forcing my students to reactivate that learning over time. So I've, def I've defined, and I'll show you why in a second. I've defined it as daily, weekly, monthly. Now, of course, you could do something like lesson review, topic review, chapter review. You could do something like one day review, seven day review, 14 day review. It's entirely up to you. Of course, how that fits into something like your homework policy is an interesting one. I've presented that like it has to be done at home. It doesn't have to be. It could be that that quiz is done in the class. It could be that we learned it 15 minutes ago and we do that quiz in class or an equivalent resource, for example. Uh, it could be that we want, the, we want the students only to do this outside of the classroom so that we maintain our class time for other things. In that case, do you have permission to set your students a 24 hour, you know, a 24 hour window to, we learned it today, you've got to review it in 24 hours. The, the, the cognitive science says, yes, that's a good idea. The homework strategy, that, that's one you're obviously gonna to have to, you're gonna to have to have a conversation around. So that for me is a, is a really, I think that's a really, really critical point that one. Now, uh, Marta, do you feel free to jump in with any questions? Yeah, no, I haven't got a question. It's uh, Jamie saying, I noticed that you have combined mastery learning alongside practice and review to try and increase the tendency to remember. I really like it. Um, so yeah, it's not a question, it's more... Um, can, I, can I stress on that one though, Jamie? I think, that's I think you're referring to the 90% there. Uh, that's something that needs clarification. I don't, again, I don't mean to keep vlogging you free webinars, but I think it's next Monday, we're doing a session on mastery. Can I stress to you about mastery challenges? is that if you say to a child, student, bunch of learners, whatever, if you say you've got 10 minutes, get 90%, it's not fair. Okay, 10 minutes, you've got 90%, it's not fair. But if you say to them, look, repeat it a number of times and don't give up until you get 90% and I'm here to support you, you've got quite a bit of time, that, that, that's fairer. You need to know your students. If you've got someone who is, if you've got someone who's experiencing some severe learning challenge, obviously you might need to temper that a little bit. Okay, so just, just be aware of that one. Um, but yeah, mastery, look, the reason we don't do mastery in most classrooms is that the, the experience are fixed in terms of time. Okay, if you flex the time and say that's the bar, most kids will get over the bar. 
uh, in my experience. But again, we're going to cover that on Monday if you're interested. Okay, let me jump back to the canvas just briefly because I want to introduce you to one other what that I one other theory that I think is important, guys. Okay. So let me just drag down slightly here. I just want to introduce you to Rosenshine. Now, this is Rosenshine is probably the, the, the second most famous Barack. His name is Barack Rosenstein ever. Um, if you really if you want to get a real graspable idea of his entire piece of work, I would encourage you to go and have a look at Tom Sherrington's recent uh, book, which is a guide for teachers on Rosenstein's principles of instruction. But let's be clear, Rosenstein defined the best principles of instruction, how we cause learning to happen. And he studied cognitive science, not least what we just looked in terms of Ebbinghausen and Thalheimer. He studied the teachers that get, that get the best gains in classrooms, what we call master teachers. And he also looked at research on cognitive support. And what he meant by that was how do good, good teachers scaffold complex tasks and learning. And from this research, he brought out 10 principles that he felt were pivotal in the causing of learning. And I'm going to not go through all of them. Again, this is not meant to be a study of Rosenshine. I just want to draw out some facets. They're numbered one to 10, which makes life quite easy for us. So let me just take, I'll literally read you through them, highlighting the bit that I want to stress. So the first principle of great instruction is start with a review. Now, we probably all do that in things like lesson um, starters and openers, things like that. But what do we mean by that review? Is it really teaching? Is it a Kagan structure? Is it a quick quiz? Is it a game? Is it some kind of recall question and answer task? But review is important. Okay, look at this one. Number two, new info in small steps, which of course goes quite neatly with, neatly with the idea of space practice earlier. Uh, sorry, space learning earlier. But importantly, practice after every step okay really important that we stress that practice causes the tendency to retrieve encoded information from the long-term memory better okay ask large numbers of questions and check responses of all again think about the mechanisms that you might adopt to do that so we are effectively asking questions again we could just be in the classroom at the front asking those questions see what bounces back for me, that's not a really effective model. For me, I would be looking at some combination of, uh, of Kagan structure-based questioning methodology, which is far more efficient. And I would be using machines for, um, for what they're good at, which is sort of at the level of quiz level learning and, and, and asking. Provide models, I'm gonna mention that in a second, but I didn't wanna circle that one, so it didn't really come up for us. But this is guided student practice. Again, we've got another principle of practice and review that causes learning. Even here, check for student understanding. Okay, how do we do that? We've got to have some kind of practice or testing or quizzing environment to do that potentially. This is what Jamie's picked out, I think, from earlier. Obtain high success rates. Now, we can call that mastery learning if you want. The point I just want to repeat again is if you set something like a mastery standard, call it a perfect answer, 90 on a quiz, whatever you want to define it as in a task, okay, getting all the marks on a past paper question, whatever, you can only expect that if there's, the, if there's a variability of time. Can I just stress that? That's the only way to make that human. So we got provide scaffolding for different tasks. And look at this one. Require and monitor independent practice. And guys, this one, engage in weekly and monthly review. So you can see where I've nicked the idea of daily review, which is simply what you would call, you know, lesson review. It's simply what have we just learned and how? And can you quickly practice it to prove that you understand it or to engage, to embed it deeper in the memory? But we've also, according to Rosenstein, got this idea of some kind of weekly review, which allows us to practice that which has been covered in detail in the last, say, approximately seven days. And a monthly review, probably interspersed with many other uh, learning types of the learning that we've done. So what I want to quickly do, guys, is I just want to jump forward and look at this monthly review idea. I'll, I'll skip the weekly one. Let me uh, let me stop sharing there. And I'm just going to jump on to, feel free to jump in again, Marjorie, if you want to, by the way. Um, so what I'm going to do is, I'm still in that test mode environment that was in earlier, but what I'm going to do is I want to go back to the assignment. So I'm not doing so well on this test. I've only got 37.5%, not very good, is it? But what I want to show you now is imagine I'm some days later and I'm doing this checkpoint three monthly review. Can I remind you guys that what's gonna happen now, it's almost like I've learned this some time ago. I've practiced it numerous times, 
And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to practice it again in the context of other learning from other areas too. Okay, so I click into here. Notice here I've got 14 days. You saw me change that in this. I'm going to take the checkpoint, okay? 90%, use practice mode as much as you need to to get cracking. I can show you that as well. But I'm going to take the checkpoint. So look what I've got here. I've got half an hour to do 40 questions, okay? And I'm being asked the question here, look closely at this image. What type of control is C? It says adrenaline acts on the, the SA node. I think the answer there is hormonal because I've learned it. Okay, so I put my answer in and it's going to take me forward. So I'm getting different. Remember, conduction system was our original learning. I'm going to start guessing now, by the way, so please don't judge my answers. I'm dragging stuff in. I'm using images to check my answers. I'm going to start answering questions. Now, sooner or later, sooner or later, I'm going to get a question on the conduction system, which is interspersed, interspersed interspersed with other learning from other topics. I was sure it was going to come up uh, faster than this. That'll be the next question, right? Definitely. Oh, come on, let's just skip a couple. There we go, it came up eventually. So there you go. So it's now interspersing my original learning on the conduction system. It's interspersing it with other learning from other units that I might have studied recently. There's another question that's thrown up from the conduction system. So the point I want to make, guys, is that I'm forcing my students to learn with me, hopefully as strong as possible in whatever model you use. I'm forcing them to daily review, again, structure it, word it, time it how you think is right. Think about Ebbinghaus and that tendency to forget. I'm telling them at a week's time, you're gonna review, and it's a quizzing environment, it's, it's language, it's, it, it's encoding, it's bringing things back from the long-term memory. And then a month later, mixed in with other learning, they're going to be reviewing and practicing that again. And one thing I would just stress to all of you guys that I can't emphasize the importance of this enough. I'm in the checkpoint assignment here. I'll just quickly dip out of it. If I go to my course, I didn't do very well, right? If I go to my course, I think I'm on OCR, physiological studies. Let me check. If I go to my course, I can go and practice this. So Here's, look, this is roughly what I was doing, cardiovascular and respiratory system. There's that checkpoint three that I got 10% on. If I go in here, I can practice anything from this, um, from this chapter, okay? So I can go and do a bunch of practice questions that are from this chapter before I go into that sort of testy mode. I'll rephrase that, not testy mode. That could mean something very different. Uh, before I go into that more formative testing mode, okay? So I can go in, I can do a bunch of practice questions. I can spend as long as I want in here. My teacher's not judging my answers and I can get myself ready for those extractions of information that I want to show that this practice has caused in me, okay? So for me, a couple of critical points to kind of summarize there. One is forgetting is far faster than you would want it to be, especially if learning is meaningless. When it comes to meaning, get it, you know, associating learning with all kinds of sort of engaging stimuli is going to cause the tendency for the learning to be more meaningful. Explaining why it causes the learning to be more meaningful, understanding why you're learning something. If we look at, uh, if we look at Kirshner Caviglioli based on the work of Pavia, we've got this notion of dual coding, which is if you can combine really high quality image based models with linguistic questions practice we can combine them we get this notion of double barrel learning you encode better because it's visual and linguistic a lot of you all know about a bit about working memory and badly and that sort of stuff i'm not going to go down that route today but if we get both high quality visual models rosenshein mentioned that of course as well and we get really really good linguistic prompts in our practice environments the tendency to remember goes up so meaningful learning. There's also something called flashbulb memory. Now, in a really grotty, horrible sense, you, you know, people of our age, you probably remember um, incidents that you'll never erase from your memory, like, right, like where you were on 9-11, or I think the elder generation would say when, you know, when Kennedy was killed, no one, forget, no one can forget where they were. Well, that's called a flashbulb memory. If we can cause the learning of new information to be like deeply embedded with something that is meaningful for the student the tendency to forget is far lower now please let me stress that could be something like a great demonstration a great practical it could be just 
that you show the student that you care when you explain it to them. These are going to cause more meaningful engagement with the, with the new learning. But what we don't want is, here's what you need to know. Here's a list of characteristics. Here's another list of characteristics. Here's a definition. That is getting dangerously close to meaningless, dangerously close. Now, that's not to say we don't need to learn those things, but it needs to be embedded with something that means something to the student. I think Jamie's point about project work even comes back on that one. Second, so we've got getting can happen rapidly, make it meaningful. Secondly, engage by structure, practice with your students. Now, how you wanna do that is your, is your call. For me, not to use machines and the automation of machines for the speed of setting assignments, to set quiz, to get the automation of uh, marking and answering at that level. I mean, it's a no brainer in my book. I mean, it's just absolutely essential, whatever tool you use to do that, okay? Um, and, and, and finally, you know, what we're saying here is learn, 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 learn. Nothing wrong with practicing as you go, of course, as Rosie said, learn, 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 learn. learn. But at the peak of that learning, the end of that lesson might summarize that point, I suppose. Don't forget to practice after that point has happened. And Rosenstein would argue daily, weekly, monthly. Interpret that in your own meaning. Structure that in the way that you think it should be structured. But that's a reasonable guide. You could do lesson, topic, chapter. You could do daily, weekly, fortnightly you guys decide what you think is best. But what you can be clear is if they reutilize that information, the, t the time it takes to forget is gonna get longer and longer, and that is gonna bolster future learning. So I think they're the majority of the points I wanted to make. I was, if we'd had more time, I meant to have more time, I was gonna do some work on um, Caviglioli and Kirshner on, on dual coding. What I'll say, Marta, is if you could post these guys the link to the podcast I've done with each of them. Yes, I have. Uh, okay. I've already. I've already done it. It's, it's I, on the chat. Um, I was going to say. I mean, what you say is really interesting because it, it makes you realise that um, actually making learning memorable. Um, it, it's, it, it sort of fulfills a dual purpose, doesn't it? Because on the one hand, it makes it, it fulfills a purpose that then, of course, you're, you're going to retain it for longer in itself. But also, then it, that's that learning that you've retained. It's also going to help you retain the, the learning you do after that because it feeds into that new learning it, it, because that, that new learning is anchored into something that you remember from before. So, well, and what, um, you've just, what you've just said there, Marta, is very functional. You know, I learn something new, therefore I can learn something. In the exactly. Future. But don't forget that affective aspect of this before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all know. Look, I'm not a very good dancer, folks. If I go into a dance class and I learn, I, I would be terrified, right? I, because I, I feel like a failure. I feel like I've got two left feet. I feel like a cumbersome idiot when I'm on a dance floor, right? But if I go into a dance studio and I learn something well, even if it's very, very simple, what is that going to do to my effective state when the proposal of a second learning episode is going to be there? I'm going to feel more confident. The fact that I can put my feet in the place in the right place is one thing because someone's taught me it and I've practiced it. That's great. But it's also in the heart. Like I want to learn that next thing because actually I did all right on this. Mm -hmm. And that for me shouldn't be underestimated. I think there is a whole swathe of young people who've internalized a lot, a lot, a lot of failure in their scrap. Failure is probably too strong a word. Um, mediocre performance in their learning cycle through their school life. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah. that effectively, emotionally, must be quite challenging. I'm not suggesting we should be like super soft on students and be all gushing and, you know, never make things challenging. Make it super challenging. But we have to honour the fact that when you learn something well, well once, mm -hmm. it causes you to enjoy the experience and wanting to learn in the future as well. And don't forget that natural high. When you learn something, it's one of the greatest natural highs that you can have as a human being, in my opinion. And this, I think, at the level we're talking today, in terms of how we practice and review and the time phasing of it, that's how we learn well. That's how we encode information to long-term memory, by forcing retrieval of that information mm -hmm. out. And by the way, it also has implications for things like the need for revision. You know, um, I think revision before an exam is a really good thing, right? Almost all of it, I, I, literally all of us have experienced it, and certainly we've experienced it with our students. But the need to relearn something shouldn't be there at the revision state, right? If they have to relearn it, that means by definition they've forgotten it. 
And if they've forgotten it, that curve has happened. Now, of course, it could be based in the young person. They couldn't be bothered or they, they weren't interested. Okay, maybe. But there's also something structurally which is allowing that forgetting to to take place yeah. okay and we've got sorry james and we've got a question from steve allen he's saying really interesting concept with the checkpoints is there a way to add in previous content questions or is this done automatically i'll show you so the the direct answer steve is um uh, is no on the checkpoints but you can make your own checkpoints i'll show you right now what i would say to everyone and martin if you post the link and, and for, guys i always feel horridly awkward at these moments um if anybody wants a demo of the website, I've just shown you it's owned by myself and Marta. If you're interested in implementing that either in uh, PE, Spanish, French, biology, chemistry, geography, history, computing, English literature, they're all available on our platform. You're very, very welcome to uh, to book a demo with us. Marta's going to put a link of how yep. we book. We've got, de we've got demos just that are done. already booked in, but just ask mm -hmm. one, ask for one at the time so uh, with that in mind steve let me answer and by the way steve how are you it's, it's lovely to it's lovely to albeit in this context chat to you uh, St steve and i um i mean will it be fair to say steve that we we experienced a, a slightly emotional moment together once with involving a flat tire outside the front of your school steve so that was a that was an interesting moment but uh let me go back here so i need to in fact i need to quickly guys let me just stop my chat i've got to log back in this i'm logged in as draco so let me just super quick Log in as McGonagall. I'll show you how I do this. So just bear with me a second. Sorry, folks. McGonagall. That's how you spell that. Right, now I can show you. So let's assume, Steve, that you are on a monthly review and you want your students to retest on something super specific, okay? I'm going to create a new assignment. I'm going to hit test yourself. I'm going to choose a course at random. Let's do, I'll do a GCSE course. I'll do McGonagall. I'll do NXL GCSE PE. Right. This is how you do it. Select lessons. Let's say you want all of the skeleton, but you don't want joints. You want muscle, muscle, muscle. But for whatever reason, you don't want fiber types. You're not doing it till next term, say. And you want, I don't know, you want aerobic and anaerobic energy. So it would be an odd combination. But nevertheless, let's just go with it. Okay, so I've chosen those things. I want a quiz of, I'm going to go for 15 questions. And I'm going to set a passing standard at uh, 80%. And I'm going to set it to start to open now. And I'm going to set it to close. Let's just do tomorrow. And let's just do it 6 p.m. tomorrow for whatever reason. Okay. I could put some stuff in here. This is, let's just call it monthly, monthly review. I can put in here any text that you want. You know, you can just put in a bunch of stuff here, give instructions to your students. Now, do you want your students to retake it? more than once i'm going to say yes is it for is it mandatory yes is it for all your students or is this specifically for harry hermione george and draco okay i'm going to say right it's not for i've changed my mind. it's not for draco it's for those three it could be all your students of course but i'm now going to create that assignment done they've now got one day left and it's going to track everything it does for me and it's going to deliver those marks into my assignment mark book on the website as well. Okay. So it's like, it's a proper efficient way of getting review and practice into your students at the quiz level. Please don't replace other skills, prose based writing, exam paper, past questions, past paper questions, do that too. Okay. We're not suggesting you replace that with this, but it would certainly build to those experiences beautifully. So just to be clear, that assignment is now set. It's, it's notified to the students. They've been emailed, including reminders, and it's going to mark it all for me and deliver the results back into my assignment mark book. I can now put my feet up and get a cigar on if I'm so inclined. Okay. So yeah, so you can do it that way. So you can literally define, uh, Steve, what, um, what content you want them to review at a particular moment of time. And again, if you want to differentiate different level of assignments of different students, you can do that too. I mean, you could theoretically, plan your entire course out for the entire year and then put your reviews in before September. The problem with that is of course, is what happens if you get a snow day or what happens if, um, you know, what, what happens if, I don't know, someone sets the fire alarm off six times in your lesson or whatever, just be aware of that. But you know, you, you can certainly stay a month ahead or a few weeks ahead and do it that way. Um, so yeah, there you go. Anything else, Marta? No, we haven't got, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, there, there aren't any, any other questions, really. No. 
Okay, cool. So look, I think what's important from my perspective, guys, is you've got the you've got those images that we've shared on the um, in the folder there. I think Martin put them in right at the start. Uh, the recording of this is going to be available as well. I, I, what I would ask for you guys, I mean, there's, there's there's two reasons we do these things. For, well, there's three. One is I just a bit of a shot. I quite like doing it. Um, but there's three reasons we do this for free. Obviously. Come, it's obvious, right? We we show you how we do these things with our platform, and therefore there's you know there's that. Um, the other thing, guys, is if if that fit, if what we just talked about you think is relevant to a broad range of people in your school, to your SLT, this, then get them on it. You know, get give them the recording, get them involved, talk to us about it, and we'll we'll support them on it. Now, I'm not suggesting I have the answer to exactly how to do practice and review and religious studies at A level. Look, I mean, it could be very bespoke. I don't know. Um, but the principle of it and developing the principle of it with a range of teachers is very, very achievable. So uh, the, the recording will be available. I love doing this stuff. Um, I feel like I've been away for quite a while in some ways. It's, it's hard to stress to you guys the effort it took to get that platform I showed you just now um, to where it needed to be and get off the ground. It was quite stuff. So a lot of the last 12 months, it's been head down grind. We're super proud to let you know that we're going to have um, seven to eight subjects available from September. We literally uploaded our biology and chemistry courses today. So I can't wait for them to come out. I think it's the best stuff we've ever done. Um, and that's it's really exciting so um we appreciate you being here as well it's really nice thanks to marta for doing the chat um we'll be in touch afterwards um you'll be redirected onto a page that allows you to book onto a demo with us we've got a couple that we do with multiple schools but just if you want a demo of the website with us and how to do that let us know a time we will do an hour with you specifically in this kind of environment and you guys can speak back to us Thanks for everyone for attending. Uh, it's lovely to reconnect with a bunch of you as well. Alex, I think, I think I'm right in saying Alex Thompson's at Epsom. Am I right on that one? I might have the wrong Alex. I think I'm right. Epsom College. I was at Epsom College recently. What a beautiful place. What a wonderful group of teachers too. Um, brilliant. Uh, Jamie, uh, you're, you're, a, you're a friend, Jamie, and I appreciate, I appreciate you being here. Javier, gracias. Uh, como siempre, es, es una oportunidad para mí uh, hablar una amiga de catalá. Uh, I'm tú, claro. Uh, and to everyone else who I know a little of oh, Paul Towns is in Paul Towns. Come on. If anybody doesn't know Paul Towns is he doesn't like to get a bit of a shout out. I want to give him a shout. Paul Towns is not only the genius behind P for learning dot com, but is the genius behind the best accent I've ever heard in my life. So if you ever get a chance to chat to Paul Towns, he's got a magnificent, beautiful Geordie accent and um, he's a great guy. Paul, we haven't seen each other for a while. You and I need a beer damn soon. Uh, Steve Allen, Stuart Forrest, you guys. I don't mean to miss anyone out, obviously, guys, but obviously there's, there's a lot of people in. I'm just being slightly, slightly selective. It's like that thing of picking teams in MP. Um, right, guys, have a beautiful evening. Thanks, as always, for your time. Really appreciate it. How do I stop this thing? Have a great evening, guys. Take care.